this is my single blade programmable screw advance box joint jig. And this is an example of the kind of joinery that you can do on this jig. Of course, you can also make simple box joints like the wide ones on this shop drawer or the narrow ones on these decorative boxes. All of these joints are made with the same single blade and with no separate calibration or setup needed for the different joint sizes. In this video, I'll talk about the design and building of the jig. And in a companion video, I'll talk about how you make these double-double box joints on the jig. This isn't the first, the second, or even the hundredth video on YouTube about box joint jigs. Lots of people have amazing designs and, and innovative ideas, and I'm just hoping I can contribute a little bit to the conversation. There are three people in particular that uh, helped me out a lot, and I'd like to point those out. Matthias Wandel seems to have inspired most everybody who has made a screw advanced box joint jig. His design is highly sophisticated, yet refreshingly low-tech. No computers in this one. Although Ben Brandt and I took very different approaches to writing the software in our jigs, his design gave me great ideas about what that software should do. He was also brave enough to record the very first tryout of his jig, which is more than I can say. And finally, the physical design of my jig owes a lot to Cosmos Bowers. His videos are definitely worth a look. You're looking at two computers here. This one controls this motor, which turns this threaded rod to move this carriage back and forth. It also connects to my home Wi-Fi, which allows me to use this computer, my regular laptop, as a control console. This computer has a program on it called BoxJoint and a bunch of simple files called cut plans. I'll demonstrate the operation of the jig by doing one step from the process of making a double-double box joint. On one piece we need to make a half inch wide cut and then repeat doing a 5 16 inch space followed by an 11 16 inch cut for the remainder of the piece. Then on a contrasting piece with the grain running in the, at 90 degrees to the first piece we need to do just the opposite. Cut wherever there's a space on the first piece and vice versa. When we're done, the pieces should fit together precisely as these do. Here's a spoiler. The pieces we're about to cut will fit together as well as these do because through the process of cinematic time warping, these pieces are those pieces. Now, assuming that this is the first time we've needed this particular pattern of cuts, the first step is to create a text file with the cut plan. Cut plan files are pretty simple. Here's what's in the one we're going to use. This line tells the program how wide a blade kerf it should assume. This will be close to, but not necessarily exactly the same as the actual kerf width. We can tweak it to adjust the tightness of fit. The wider the assumed kerf, the tighter the joint will fit. For the blade I'm using, this value will give us a snug fit. I might want to back it off by a thousandth or two if, for example, I plan to use a water-based glue and needed to allow for the glue making the wood swell a little. This line says to make a cut half an inch wide. This line says to repeat everything that follows until we stop the program. And this is the sequence that will be repeated. I start the program by typing on my laptop the name of the program, the name of the cut plan file we want to use, and the fact that we want to cut side A of the joint. When I do that, the first thing the program does is to move the carriage to its home position if it isn't already there. The program knows when it's at the home position because of this little limit switch right here. With the jig in its home position, we should align our workpiece right at the edge of the kerf the blade will cut. This is not the same as where the flat part of the blade is. To provide a good alignment surface, I made an alignment bar out of a piece of 1 8 inch aluminum 
and uh, put just enough slick tape and uh, very thin aluminum duct tape on one side of it to make it fit snugly into this slot. And this slot is the same as the blade's kerf. Now why did I need this big wooden handle? Well, it blocks access to this button, which is the one I push to make cuts. So I can't accidentally start cutting with the alignment bar still in place. Don't ask me why I think that reminder might be necessary. Here, from the back of the jig, we see the alignment bar being pushed through the slot. I line the workpiece up with the reference edge, make sure it's flat on the table saw surface, and clamp it down. Now I have found that uh, pieces want to rise up a bit as they're cut on the tail end, even if they're clamped pretty firmly. So for a wider piece, I would clamp down the other end also. For a narrow one like this, what I like to do is clamp a, another piece on top of it like this. That will keep this tail end from being able to rise at all as it moves across the table. The carriage moves to the next cut position anytime I press this button here. And you can see the carriage movements best probably by, by looking at this piece right there. Here are the cuts as seen from the back of the jig. To make the matching cuts in our contrasting piece, we call the program with the same cut plan, but tell it we want side B. Then we go through the same steps to position the workpiece and make the cuts. So, do the pieces we just cut fit together? Told ya. I've taken the carriage off so you can see the guts of the system a little bit better. On the end, physically, but in the middle, conceptually, is a Raspberry Pi microcomputer. It's connected to this motor controller, stepper motor controller, which in turn is connected to the motor itself. The stepper motor turns back and forth to turn this Acme threaded rod, which is what moves the carriage back and forth. The computer is also connected to this limit switch here that is, is used to tell us when the carriage is in its home position. These two blocks are just handles for pushing the thing back and forth and I press this button to move to each new cut position. The carriage, seen here upside down, has a guide rail to let it move smoothly back and forth, and the brass nut that the threaded rod goes through to drive the carriage. It's mounted so strangely because the brass nut is a featureless cylinder that I had to clamp somehow, and because it's kind of out there in space and I wanted to be able to make fine adjustments so it wouldn't deflect the rod too much. On the back of the jig, I put some miter track embedded in a dado. This mates with the miter bar in the carriage and lets the carriage move back and forth very smoothly. The only thing holding the carriage against the body of the jig is the threaded rod, and there's enough flex in that to let the carriage wander in and out a little bit as it travels. This could interfere with the accuracy we want. We need a way to pull the carriage tight against the body of the jig without impeding its lateral travel. Some people use springs to achieve this, but I've gone a different route. These two knobs 
are on bolts that have roller bearings on them like, like this one does. I can pull the carriage toward me, push the knobs, push the bearings tight against it, and tighten the knobs. The result is a carriage that's held firmly in line, but could still move freely. With only two knobs, why are there so many slots? The roller bearings can limit the carriage travel when they run into the stuff that's on the ends of the jig. This one is easy. It's positioned just short of where the limit switch stops travel anyway. For the other one, there's a trade-off between leverage and, uh, and length of travel. This slot gives maximum leverage and still has plenty of room to travel for the kind of small box pieces we're doing right now. But for wider work pieces, I can choose a different slot if I need to, to allow extra travel. To avoid splintering on the back side of a cut, you need a backer board of some sort. Because the part of the jig below the carriage is uh, never moved sideways with respect to the blade, we can have a backer board mounted on the jig rather than needing a separate one for each work piece. This is a piece of quarter inch MDF that's held in place with, with double-sided tape and sits flush with or a couple of thousandths proud of the jig surface. This slot was made by the blade set at the height we've been using, so it provides zero clearance support for any cuts on this project. If our next project uses the same blade and the same blade height or higher, we could leave this board in place. Otherwise, we can pop it out and put a fresh one in. It may seem strange to talk about simplicity in a video about an over-the-top jig like this one, but I did end up not having to do a lot of things that I thought would be needed after seeing other people's projects. I thought I'd need an LED to tell me when the jig is in position for the next cut, but I can just look at the nut at the end of the threaded rod. When it stops spinning, we're good to go. My only interactions with the jig software are by, to start it by typing it on the command line, stop it with a keystroke, and tell it when to move to the next cut with the one and only button. Originally, I had a couple of other buttons, but it turned out that they were doing things that were just as easy to do with keystrokes on the, on the laptop. The biggest surprise was how simple the software could be. It's worth pointing out that I've been a programmer all my adult life, and I'm comfortable with text editors and command line interfaces on computers. People with different backgrounds might be better served by something like Ben Brandt's smartphone app. But the way I did it, with my computer for the control terminal, no progress displays, no smartphone app, and text files for my cut plans, the software for this jig was the easiest thing about building it. The whole thing consists of only about 200 lines of Python. I have a link in the notes for where you can download a copy of the software if you like. I've also put in notes in the notes a list of where I got the various parts that aren't common items at hardware stores or woodworking stores. Well, that's about it. Thanks for watching, and happy joinery.